Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. My name is John Cameron, and I'll be your host tonight. I'm going to have uh, the other two guests quickly introduce themselves, what they're doing currently, and then we're going to talk about how we came to the Liberty Movement, and then talk about some um, very newsworthy topics that uh, hopefully will, will uh, resonate with libertarians everywhere, the thousands that are in our audience this evening. So uh, again, my name is John Cameron. Uh, you can watch Libertarian Counterpoint uh, at 8 o'clock on Thursday at uh, uh, Channel 17 in the Comcast viewing area. Check your guides in other areas. You can also watch it at noon on Friday. And my very favorite time, I get up, have my Cheerios, my three cups of coffee at 4 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. And if you don't want to do that, probably the easiest way to watch the show is on YouTube about an, a week after they air. That way you can pause it, make rude comments, uh, you know, post comments, seven thumbs up about the show. Um, right now I am um, a development officer for Pacific Legal Foundation. I raise money so that our wonderful lawyers, our pit bull lawyers, well, we have one here this evening, can grab the government by the throat and shake the Constitution out of it because they want to take it away from us, folks, and we fight to keep it. And Jeremy Talcott, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. As John said, my name is Jeremy Talcott, and I'm one of the attorneys with Pacific Legal Foundation. And as you mentioned, we're a uh, law firm that uh, litigates for private property rights and individual liberty nationwide. And Daniel, you also happen to work for Daniel Sheehan. Introduce yourself. <laughs> well, yes, my name is Daniel Sheehan. I am the development researcher at Pacific Legal Foundation. I actually am right across the hallway from John, so I see John quite a bit, uh, which is an experience, usually a good experience. <laughs> and an experience anyway, folks. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's certainly an experience. It, 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 I would say it's a good experience. Yeah. I don't know if he feels the same way. <laughs> but uh, I, I heard about the liberty movement and the, got into the idea of liberty. Uh, a long time ago, I, I read a book by John Stossel called Myths, Lies, and Downright Stupidity. And at the time, I thought I was reading something by conservative authors, mm -hmm. because I was reading up on Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and those sorts of guys. And I thought that's what Stossel's book was. But as I was reading, I was like, wow, there's more philosophy to this. There's this idea of just liberty as a whole, not just a rejection of certain things, but of the ideals of liberty. And I was like, this is a great idea. And I got into the whole concept of the liberty movement, and so I was really excited when I got to work at Pacific Legal Foundation, where we defend those ideals. Hmm. Cool. And Jeremy, uh, tell us a little bit about how you came to the liberty movement. Well, you know, you can probably blame the internet. I like, like many people, I, I, around the early 2000s, I think I hadn't quite figured out exactly what I believed. I knew that uh, the two major parties really had not appealed to me, and discovered a lot of resources like Reason Magazine. Uh, 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 there's a, a blogger named Warren Meyer who, who runs Coyote Blog that really resonated with me. And, and I think, you know, probably reading, like Daniel, uh, reading Free to Choose by Milton Friedman fairly well changed my life. And uh, I realized that I wanted to find a way also to work in the liberty movement and, and fighting for the ideals that I believed in. And that's what ended up sending me to law school and then bringing me to Pacific Legal. Mm. Oh, you also uh, interned, um, did you, you interned in a standard law firm? Did you do some time at one of the other Liberty organizations between uh, law school and, and here? I, I did intern with a standard uh, firm down in Orange County, California during law school. I also actually was able to take part in the Liberty Clinic during law school, which is a clinic that Pacific Legal Foundation runs at Chapman University in, Chapman. Yeah. in Orange County, California. Was that with Larry Salzman? That's correct, with okay. Larry Salzman, one of the uh, senior attorneys at Pacific Legal, mm -hmm. and an opportunity to, during law school, uh, be involved in direct representation cases that Pacific Legal brought was really eye-opening experience and contrasting that experience in the clinic with the uh, experience of being in a standard civil litigation law firm, uh, I, w I was very, very certain of where I wanted to end up. Very certain. Well, my, my path to liberty movement uh, probably started age 15 or so hanging around with some older guys, my, my brother being one, who were uh, Randites and objectivists and all the rest of that. And, and it struck me that, that the kind of laissez-faire capitalism and um, 
self-accountability was really what was reflected in nature uh, and, and all of the Greens and, or, or socialists and somehow they look at, at the, the accountability that, that uh, the, the beautiful simplicity of nature imposes that the fittest survive and thrive and, and the weak or, or, or unable uh, don't um, amass the herd and find the green pasture and everything else. Yet somehow when it comes to human beings, they think they, they respond to different laws than the laws of nature. And then later in life, after I'd worked in the corporate world uh, long enough to see the abuses of what uh, is kind of innocently called the administrative state, I call it the police state, um, I wasn't a lawyer and I didn't have the ability to write a uh, $100,000 check, but I've been in sales and marketing my whole life, so I thought raising money for Pacific Legal Foundation was a good way to support liberty. So now we're here, and we're going to talk about some topics. Uh, recently, the, um, I think it's the state of California in its infinite wisdom has decided that uh, the only people that can have guns on campus are security personnel. And, and in the past, People who had concealed carry permits, um, you know, teachers, staff, administrators on certain campuses were allowed to have guns. And I know, um, you know, personally of a gentleman who uh, had a gun store. Kids are in school in Placerville, and he used to go out in the morning and kind of be a uh, a crossing guard, and also in the in the afternoon. And the principal was really happy to have somebody trained and licensed to carry a firearm. Uh, because the security people are few and far between and nowhere to be found usually, um, guarding the kids in essence. And uh, now this is uh, uh, illegal. So even the campuses, uh, some in, in, in the Sacramento area who allowed uh, licensed people, trained people, people who understood and used firearms and were expert in them, to have them on campus are now precluded from doing so, and the only people that can do it are security people, are nobody. So, Daniel, you think this is a good idea? Well, I understand the reasons why someone would want this sort of a policy. Hmm. The goal is to try and reduce guns. And the idea is they think that if there are less guns, there will be less violence. Hmm. But the problem is, when someone says that they want to get rid of guns, hmm. They don't actually want to get rid of guns because they still want the government to have guns. Mm. And the government's going to have to round up the other people who have the guns. Mm. So really when someone says they don't want people to have guns, they're just saying they want to create a monopoly on who has guns. Mm. And that to me is more dangerous than the idea of someone having guns in the first place mm. because now only one group has the power. Mm. And I think that that's, when, when people are able to share uh, in both power or wealth mm -hmm. or whatever it is, when there's a pushback, mm. when there's competition, mm. that's when people are the most free. Mm. But when only one side has all the wealth or has all the power, then the people aren't actually free. Mm. So, so what, do you, what do you think about it on a pragmatic, and feel free to jump in, Jeremy, yeah. on a pragmatic level, um, if, if whether having guns or not having guns is a good thing, um, the idea that that um, you have in the news, you have all these people who are not all these people. There are a number of people who like to take pot shots at kids. Uh, they like to take pot shots at people enjoying outdoor concerts and things. Do you think that they are more likely to take that pot shot if they know that nobody at the shooting range, down down range, kids or uh, people at an outdoor concert in Las Vegas is armed and can it do anything about it? Or do you think from fairly a pragmatic standpoint, where I'm not right or wrong, if the idea that perhaps one out of 500 of those people might have a weapon and shoot back, do you think that would deter violence? Well, they've actually done studies on where shootings happen. Mm. And as a general rule, more often than not, shootings actually happen in gun-free zones. Okay. So it's actually, to a certain extent, like you were talking about, it's an incentive to say, all right, if you shoot here, mm. there will not be someone who can fight back. Mm. So whether or not that enters the thought process of the criminals, I don't know. Mm. I, I don't know their minds. Yeah. But it does yeah. seem like statistically, that's probably part of what they're thinking. Mm. Okay, Jeremy, you wanna weigh in on this one? 
You know, I'll, I'll say the, the thing that I just find odd about the policy is the fact that, you know, they're, they're admitting that guns will help. Uh, they're still allowing security guards to have guns on the campus. There's, mm. there's, there's an area where they know that a gun will potentially stop a crime, mm. and yet they want to clamp down on the possibility that a non-government actor might be the hero that saves the day. Um, it, you, know, you think I, that's their motivation, or do you think they don't think that deeply about it? That uh, that they just. But let me. So I think you brought up a good point, and I and I might have just skated past, not realizing where I think the seed of the great thought is here, is that um, there is a tendency, especially in this state, to think that the government is the solution uh, to all problems. And um, we in the liberty movement might uh, think that the government really is the cause of almost all the problems we have, and that right-thinking free individuals who are self-accountable and moral um, maybe are the solution. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I think that uh, you know, people making good decisions and behaving responsibly is probably the solution to most of the concerns that we're, we're worth talking about. There's no way government can predict who's going to snap, who's going to be the person. There's no way they can have enough officers out and about prepared at any moment in the right location where there might be uh, the next mass shooting. Mm -hmm. So um, instead allowing people, and especially in this case where it's a top-down control on the ability of communities mm -hmm. to try and find the best solution, uh, preventing the possibility that some of these like I said, some of these communities might come up with a better solution. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a, f I think there's a top-down fear of that. That if, if it does work in some of these locations, if it does, uh, if if there is violence stopped in a more rural community because half of the teachers were armed, it calls into question a lot of the policies that are mm -hmm. fervently still being adopted in uh, in a lot of the more urban areas. So uh, just to kind of uh, voice vote here, uh, not a secret ballot. Uh, do we think this is yet again the state of California making a mistake at the top and trying to, to force its will and policies on communities? I think That's it's a mistake. Usual. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, I would agree. I, I don't think that they would call it that. I think there's mm -hmm. usually you don't see evil people doing evil things. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. It's they think that they're helping, mm -hmm. and yet to a certain extent that might be more dangerous because that's how you get bad policies across. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's a quote, and it's about religion, but I think, and I'm trying to remember who did it, it said, um, many of the worst evils uh, in, the, in the world have been done in the name of religious fervor. And I think um, in, in our day and age, that religious fervor, the, the God is government in many people's eyes. The God is, is central control, and somehow um, a uh, bureaucrat or, or a bunch of uh, uh, folks who are elected um, or somehow smarter than the people who put them into office or are paying their wages. So let's talk about another thing in the state of California, which is very interesting. State of California, uh, there was an article again, in, and I have to thank that, that great uh, liberal uh, newspaper um, in town, um, Sacramento Bee for running this story, that lawyers are running amok in California suing over food. Uh, and what, what happens is it's known throughout the country that uh, the courts in the state of California are very favorable for any, any food-oriented or anti, I would call it anti-food-oriented lawsuit. Um, and it could be something as minor as mislabeled ingredients, it could be um, something about the supposed harmful effects of it, um, of a particular type of food, like you know, and, and I'm just pulling this exam example out of the air, but you know, um, high fructose corn syrup versus sugar, uh, cane sugar being supposedly better than another kind of sugar. So there's, there's lots of what in other states would be seen as frivolous lawsuits. Uh, and in California, um, companies typically, uh, in, instead of you know, fighting tooth and nail in a court of law, uh, to defend their rights, realize that they're they're uh, fighting an uphill battle, and they settle. And in many cases, uh, attorneys. And I'm not saying all attorneys are bad. Just 99 percent of the 99 percent give the one percent a bad name. That's my lawyer joke. So um, in the state of California, the, the the attorneys typically in these cases will take the lion's share of the uh, 
of the uh, reap the rewards of winning the suit. And so, uh, again, the state of California um, and its uh, court system having this set up. Is it, is it a, are, are we missing the point as, as liberty-minded folks is, uh, are, are we being defended better against the horrors of uh, corporate farming and, uh, and the horrible nutrition that is being shoved down our throats by evil capitalists in the state of California, or, or is, it, uh, is it something else? Jeremy, what do you think? Well, I, I will raise one. I'll, I'll raise kind of the libertarian defense for some, some class actions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think where, where they can be very beneficial uh, is especially in instances where uh, it's, it's more a matter of government policy. Mm -hmm. So if uh, the entire prison system of California is incompetent in many different ways, each particular person might not have the same injury, but banded together they can establish a practice and bring a, a a class action suit that requires a change in policy or mm -hmm. remedy. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the way that class action suits are now being used against companies in this way, it's taking, it's, it's looking for, it, it's kind of the opposite. It's looking for the one minor injury and then alleging it across a great swath of people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, that's where there's a real opportunity for reform. You know, uh, there is a, a benefit to finding many injuries uh, to establish, like I said, sort of a practice, a mm -hmm. general practice. Mm -hmm. But the way they are used now is to take one injury, find a named plaintiff, and then impute that to everyone who's mm -hmm. encountered mm -hmm. the product. And uh, in California, the rules are just heavily stacked against any sort of business. Mm -hmm. And you know, as you mentioned, people are coming here to litigate because they're winning over and over, even with fairly uh, claims that your average person would not believe holds much water. Maybe even find laughable. So, and actually, they're they're not losing in court. They're just realizing they're going to lose in court. And it's the sue and settle, which we see uh, the environmental groups use uh, in in many cases to establish some kind of specious taxonomy, and also to uh, put our forests at risk by uh, by preventing uh, logging and some other things. So, uh, you would say this is a, a, a we'll have the straw vote again here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's people running for election already, uh, three years out. Uh, is this um, attitude of the courts of California uh, toward this anti-business uh, pro-litigation um, environment that we're in, is it a good thing for liberty and the individual people in the state, or is it a bad thing? Uh, for liberty? Definitely not. All right. <laughs> yeah, I'd say bad thing. As I said, my, my caveat would be a lot of people talk about class action reform. I think actually class actions c can be very good and mm -hmm. we should be looking at tort reform and it's the anti-business uh, nature of the un kind of unfair competition and, mm -hmm. and unfair business practices laws that are allowing these massive recoveries. There you have it folks, in a matter of seconds we have figured out what to do in the <laughs> face of bad government. So uh, call the people in the legislature and let them know to stop this crap, okay? So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, Jeremy's going to do a lightning round of three cases because we have about 10 minutes left and we're going to let Jeremy have all of that. We might ask <laughs> a couple of questions because okay. um, we went a little long on the other two. Uh, Benedetti versus uh, County of Marin and you're the lead attorney on this case. That's correct. So this is a case that we filed in Marin County. Uh, Marin County is, uh, they're revamping their local coastal program. This is something that's passed under the California Coastal Act. Mm. Our, our great friends, the California Coastal Commission, who uh, have continually done more harm to property rights in California than I think any other uh, government agency, perhaps. But I think even counting the devil. I think they've done <laughs> more uh, damage to property rights than Mao Zedong and Lenin combined. But that's just <laughs> my, I personally call them the Communist Coastal Commission. But then again, I'm kind of a rabble rouser. Tell, so tell us what they're, they're forcing people to stay in farming. Isn't that you know, slavery? Didn't we fight a civil war over that? You know, it's, it's, I s certainly think it gets close to indentured servitude. Mm. What, we're, what we're looking at is a... Well, that makes it okay then. Right. <laughs> yeah. a, a requirement that a landowner, if they want to build a new dwelling on their property... This is a farm. Yeah. On Plenty their, of room, folks. An no, agricultural no, farm. Yeah, yeah. You know, these are farmers who own hundreds, perhaps thousands of acres. If they want to build a single dwelling on it, they need to promise that they will remain actively and directly engaged in agriculture in perpetuity. 
the county is requiring them to grant an easement, which is a property interest. And again, this, this essentially allows the, the government to tell people they cannot retire. If they do want to retire, they have to give up their land. And the plaintiff that we have in this case, uh, Willie Benedetti, turkey farmer who's been farming in Marin County for 50 years. Willie's bird? Willie's? Will, Willie bird turkeys, Willie that's bird correct. Turkeys, yeah. He's been farming in Marin County for about 50 or 60 years, and he wants to build a house for his son, uh, bring his son, so, uh, daughter-in-law, and grandkids over, step back from the business a bit, and just enjoy Marin County. Mm. Beautiful area where he lives is absolutely mm. gorgeous. Uh, and if he builds that house, he won't be able to do that. He'll mm. have to choose whether he either continues to operate or he'll have to give that land to the person who is going to be farming because the uh, covenant that the county is asking for actually runs with the land. Huh. So, uh, folks, if, if this is expanded on a greater scale, if you're flipping burgers and you want to build a house in your parking lot of your local McDonald's, you better keep flipping burgers. Uh, <laughs> I, my personal feeling is this is ridiculous. I, I don't... This is basically just an attempt to, to control uh, uh, farmland through a, a really specious reach. What do you think? Good policy, bad policy? Daniel, good or bad? Bad. Bad, okay. Unconstitutionally oh. bad. Unconstitutionally bad. Now, That's the worst ah. kind of bad. <laughs> so, so we're, uh, in this country, we're protected from illegal search and seizure by, is that Fourth Amendment? That That's right? correct. And there's a case in Santa Barbara, a zoning inspection uh, report that uh, seems to violate that. You want to tell us about it? Sure. And this is one we actually uh, just filed today. Uh, so brand new case that we're bringing. And this is in Santa Barbara County. If you sell your house, you're required to apply for a zoning information report. And as a part of that report, you have to allow a city employee to come into your house, take pictures, uh, snoop around, make mm -hmm. notes of everything that's built within the house. And then they go back to their city records look through and if they can't find a permit for any of those structures they're going to go ahead and file an abatement action against you. Mm. Which is in other words basically backdate the permit and a bunch of charges make you tear it out or make you file a permit and all right. that. Usually what they'll do is they'll tell you you have to tear it out but they don't you're not actually going to tear it out what they do is they make you go through the permitting process mm. pay penalties pay mm. the additional permitting costs. The and pay for this inspection. And I pay for the inspection okay. right. and uh, as I said, at this point, the, the ordinance also criminalizes selling your house without mm. obtaining Now, these are, of course, uh, trained professional building inspectors, <laughs> licensed contractors who have many, many years of training, right? If, of course not. Oh, uh, so oh this would these, be the government. You know, That's not needed. Right. These are yeah. city employees with no specialized training. They have no knowledge of construction practices, of electrical practices, but, you know, best plumbing practices. Mm -hmm. They're, they're not competent to look and find any sort of health or safety violations that might actually justify, if the government wanted to justify, mm. some sort of health or safety rationale. It's totally absent here. Uh, instead, they're really just looking to generate revenue. So uh, we'll take the, I love this little straw poll I'm doing here, mostly because I know <laughs> how it's going to turn. I could be wrong. Um, so uh, uh, violating the, uh, the, the uh, Fourth Amendment, uh, protection against an illegal search uh, and then on top of that having people who don't have the qualifications to actually uh, say whether they're what they're inspecting uh, is good bad indifferent or even what they think they're looking at this is a good thing for the citizens of Santa Barbara or a bad thing well, hello, I am Satan, and I love yeah. this policy. You love this policy, <laughs> yes. Satan, Daniel Satan, don't talk to yeah. me anymore. Work, I'm going to stick no. with unconstitutionally bad. I'm going to uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to agree with you and say bad. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. the heck with that th constitution thing. All it does is get in the way of government, and we love government on this show, folks. So now, um, efforts to repeal Costa Hawkins, which uh, basically kind of, if I understand it correctly, kind of allowed the, the, the much of rent control to, to be legal, which is what I see as a take act, but Actually, yeah. so Costa Hawkins is one of the few moments of economic sanity, oh. some limited economic sanity. See, that's sanity why we have a lawyer on the show, folks, in California. they know these things. So in 1995... Oh, it's uh, the opposite. Go ahead, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. In 1995, as rent control was really, uh, ha had been expanding into quite a few communities in California, mm -hmm the legislature passed Costa Hawkins. And what it did is it put a limit on rent control in a couple of really important ways. Uh, it exempted new construction. Mm. So uh, 
any economist uh, across the board, one of the most universal truths in all economics is that rent control prevents uh, or removes the incentives for people to add new supply. Mm. So because of that, once you've locked in the price of the existing houses, no new houses are built, it exacerbates the supply problem, prices continue to go up in any uh, unit that's not rent controlled to mm. try and meet uh, the de demand of the market. Mm. Casa Hawkins exempted all new construction and it also prevented something called strict rent control or vacancy control. Mm. And that's where even when the person moves out, you're not allowed to adjust. So with Costa Hawkins well, in Costa place. Costa Hawkins was a good, a law that was actually was a good, good passed law, when and then in the 90s? A good law in California, about passed in 1995, or at least a, a signed and adopted, I think, Who was the governor then? Do we remember? Uh, you know, 95 I was not Pete living Wilson? here at that Pete time. Wilson, so Pete that Wilson, so that would be yeah. like a Republican. And yeah. uh, <laughs> the legislature wasn't 100% <laughs> Democrat. But anyway, that's that's just my thing. So, so I, I now there's an effort to right. take the piece of sanity that's out there and and stomp on it and crush it to little pieces. So tell us about that in one minute, and then we've got to close sure. out the show. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll give... Minutes over. No, go ahead. I'll, I'll give Jerry Brown a little bit of credit. Efforts have been underway for several years to try and get rid of this, and he has vetoed in the past uh, bills, but... There's another one that will be coming at the beginning of 2018, another bill to repeal Costa Hawkins. If that goes away, we can see strict rent control all across California again. There'll no longer be this state level prohibition. So he, he actually vetoed a bad bill to, to repeal Costa Hawkins. That's correct, in it 2013. It was passed by legislature, and now another one's coming up in, uh, in uh, 2018. Hopefully he'll be, Moonbeam will still be alive and have enough faculties to pick up a pin and yeah, I'm, I'm not overly confident that, the, 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 like I said, the political pressure right now, there's a lot of tenant groups that mm. are making a huge push to try and get rid of Costa Hawkins. If they do, it will only make housing prices worse. It will mm. uh, remove the, the, the incentives mm. that currently exist, yeah. and, and uh, I think it would be a terrible thing for California. And there's, there's been uh, some recent legislation passed that's going to make it even worse because it's uh, prevailing wage, but maybe we can sneak that into the next show. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much. Um, I see the, by the phone lines lighting up. No, we don't have phone lines here. Don't try to call. <laughs> uh, but text, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you uh, Daniel Snow. We're not going to do that either. <laughs> I want to thank you very, very much for your attention, uh, your focus on liberty this evening. Without good folks like you watching, um, the uh, Libertarian Counterpoint and talking to your friends, the thousands of folks out there who are now watching uh, wouldn't be watching. We really appreciate you doing that. And look for us uh, again, um, 8 o'clock Thursday night. Uh, look for us at noon on uh, Friday or 4 a.m. My our time on Saturday. Or really the best way to watch the show is on YouTube about a week after it's done. Thank you so much for watching.